when I was in seminary over 15 years ago, no, more or less, uh, there was a guy in my class, he was there just for one semester, and he was from a, a religious order, who, whose name I completely forget, but they used to wear a, a, a satan with red buttons, and kind of a red trim along there. Or some kind of, I, can't, I can't remember what, what they were exactly. I'd never seen them before. Uh, but we, would, we just got talking about our various you know, missions and futures, and I told him that in my community, a lot of our missionaries go to Russia. Uh, and I asked him, so where will you be going? And he said, I'll be going back to China. And I said, right. I said, what's that like? And he said, um, yeah, some guys who were ordained last year have been killed already. Uh, so uh, I don't really know how long I'll be a priest. I was just astounded at this young man's dedication and courage. So he came to Rome to study for a semester, and then he was going to head back to China, and that would be kind of it. He might there be uh, just he didn't know how things were going to play out, how long he was going to even be alive. Uh, just very, very difficult, circum dangerous circumstances. So this kind of uh, the difference between what we're called to, to be as Christians and what the world may see as right was just made so apparent. The courage of this man and his love for the Lord. So today the church is celebrating uh, the feast day of St. Andrew Dunlac. He was a Vietnamese martyr. And right from the, about the 15th century until the early 19th century, there was violent persecution of the church there in Vietnam. Uh, and similarly in, in Korea, China, numerous places uh, there in the, in the Far East, uh, the Catholicism was, it was misunderstood for a start. Uh, it was seen as basically a, a way of control, like the Europeans trying to control the Asians, so uh, you know that we have to that we have to be obedient to the Pope. So then they kind of saw that as being obedient to a foreign leader, as opposed to we like you know when we do follow the Pope, but it's not like we we don't follow him like a a military leader or something. It's it, there's a moral example there. It's it's not like the, don't worry, we're going, to pay, we're going to pay our taxes. Like it's it's all good. Uh, so, but there was a, just a misunderstanding of what the church was. This kind of foreign influence and that. And so many leaders uh, being afraid of uh, any foreign influence saw Christianity as, as a European thing and wanted to eradicate it. So obviously many of the missionaries at the time as well were French and Spanish, Dominicans, Franciscans, uh, Jesuits and that. So yeah, they wanted to cut off all, all ties with, with, with Europe and they did so by violently persecuting those who attended mass, those who considered themselves Catholic. And they would just this, it was a simple little test, a very simple, awful little test, where they would place a cross on the ground and line up the people and say, you trample the cross, you're free. You don't trample the cross, we'll torture and kill you. You choose. Simplest little thing, just put the cross, all you have to do, just, just spit on it, just one foot, plunk, and you're good to go. And so many said, we will not, we will not do it. So there were 117 martyrs, it's, it's, a, it's a symbolic number, well, it, there, there are real 117 actual martyrs, but there were actually more, obviously, that we don't have records for, but St. John Paul II, I canonized 117 of them. So the feast day of today is St. Andrew Dunlac, who was a priest, Vietnamese priest, and companions. So it's just this, this other band of, uh, of martyrs. And again, every single one of them, uh, such incredible examples, because they knew what they were doing. They knew what they were risking. This didn't happen by accident. They knew every time they went to Mass, it could be their last Mass, or it could be the reason uh, for which they could be arrested and tortured and killed. So St. Andrew, he went around celebrating mass in homes and then the people would hide him, kind of like the used to happen here in Ireland as well. There'd be different homes or different 
fake walls or wardrobes that open into a little, different little passage in, uh, in houses where priests could hide from the authorities. There was one particularly violent uh, leader at the time, his name was M-I-H-N-M-A-N-G, so I think it's pronounced Mean Mang, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, and he was the Nero of, of Vietnam at the time, so he wanted all European influence destroyed. So uh, he persecuted the church violently, and St. Andrew Dunlac, he was arrested, but all the people, the faithful, came together and paid his ransom. Right, so he was freed again. Now imagine, like, I mean, you're arrested by those kind of authorities, like, that, that would shake you, you know. That would, that would rattle you proper. So, but they came, they, they paid his ransom. He was arrested again, and uh, they, they did the same thing. The, the, the people came to his, to his rescue by paying a ransom for him, but it didn't last long. He was, he was arrested very shortly thereafter. Uh, while going to a man's house to hear his confession, both were arrested and uh, both were tortured and killed by beheading. So it's real, it's very real, this, 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 this idea that our faith can cost us something. Uh, it's, a, it's a difficult reality, especially as I say, uh, in Ireland for us, where our faith has been so comfortable for so long, it's been so natural and so normal to be Catholic, whereas now uh, believing what the church believes, doing what the, ch what the church does, now makes us different. Uh, this is a reality that, that slowly, slowly we're, we're starting to learn, you know. Uh, going with the flow will actually cause us to rebel against our faith because if we simply do what's legal or what the majority of people think, then we're going to find ourselves doing and thinking, advocating things that are against what the Lord teaches, against what the Church teaches. So our faith now, as Catholics, is, is countercultural. It's countercultural to be Catholic. So the age of courageous Catholicism is right here. The age of comfortable Catholicism is gone. And this is something, as I say, that we're, I think that the younger Catholics realize that because right from the beginning, they've only known a church that, uh, that cost them something in the sense that if they post something on Facebook or any social media that's pro-Catholic, they know that, 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 that there could well, there will be some negative reaction that wasn't the case 30 years ago. If you, you know, in school said you went to Mass, yeah, of course you do, everyone does. You know, whereas now you say you go to Mass, why, why would you do that? What's wrong with you? Uh, so I think young Catholics are, are aware of the fact that, that our faith can cost us something. And I think they're up for the challenge. So there's great hope. There is great hope. We thank God for these kinds of martyrs that show us the kind of faith that people have, real people with real fears <clears throat> and real families whose love for the Lord is so real and so intense that they would actually sacrifice everything for him. These are just in in incredible and incredibly important for us to, to be aware of, you know, that this is the kind of love that people, human beings are capable of. So we thank the good Lord for them. And we ask him to bless us. Bless us here in Ireland. Bless the renewal of the church underway here. We pray, Lord, that we may, we may be all, every single one of us, inspired with a renewed courage, a renewed selflessness, a renewed love. Amen.